The Legend of Zelda, a classic storied video game series that only took 31 years to incorporate into its design the innovation that is the jump button. But uh, what about me? Shut up, Zelda 2, you don't count. How about us? Look, if Zelda 2 doesn't count, you two definitely don't. Um, sir, if I may. Ah, fair point, Link's Awakening. Okay, fine, Breath of the Wild was not the first Zelda game to incorporate jumping, but it's certainly a much more jump-happy game than most other Zeldas. It achieves this by combining on-demand jumping with the mechanic of the paraglider, then throwing both of those mechanics into a world built with significant focus on verticality. It all comes together to form a very engaging gameplay loop of getting to a high point, looking around, seeing something interesting, gliding to the point of interest, and repeats. What I propose we do today is not play the game that way. Instead, let's give Breath of the Wild the Kirby treatment, and seek out an answer to the following question. Is it possible to beat The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild without jumping or gliding? The first thing we've got to establish here is what exactly is going to fall under the umbrellas of jumping and gliding. The first part of our definition is that we are only counting jumping and gliding which occurs during gameplay, so we're not going to concern ourselves with things like cutscenes. The question then becomes, what do we need to concern ourselves with during gameplay? The answer comes in two parts. Part one is that we are not allowed to use the X button. The reason for this is obvious. In this game, X is the jump button. However, it does a bit more than just basic jumps. Here is a list of the wonderful actions we'll be missing out on in this challenge as a result. Jumping, flipping, side hopping, dodging, flurry rushes, gliding, jumping up cliff sides, the quick little hop thing you can do while sneaking, launching off a horse, Rivali's gale, and oddly enough, dashing while swimming. Hmm. One of these things is uh, not like the others. Part two of our rules is that we aren't allowed to make use of the paraglider regardless of what button press makes it happen. In short, this rule is that the paraglider cannot take corporeal form in the world during gameplay. Because there are ways of activating it without pressing X, so any of those we can't do. Alright, those are some pretty clear rules we've got to follow. Now to establish our goal. Normally for these challenge videos, my goal is to essentially complete an any percent run, where we just try to beat the final boss and see the end credits by any means possible. For this game though, that would probably be fairly uninteresting, since we could theoretically circumvent like 99% of the game. What I propose we do is a run of the game where we complete all of what I consider to be the major objectives in the game. What I mean by that is as follows. All four Divine Beasts freed. All 13 memories recalled, every tower activated, the Master Sword retrieved, and of course, Ganon defeated. If we can manage all that without jumping or gliding, then I'm prepared to call this challenge a success. Wake up, Link. Oh, looks like it's time to begin. Here we are in the Shrine of Resurrection. Let's hope they don't find some way to force tutorialize jumping in here. Door number one goes down without a fight. Then we can grab ourselves some clothes and see what's behind door number two! Okay, just this little mini cliff, no problem, as climbing is perfectly within our rules. Except for some reason I don't seem to be able to initiate a climb. Don't you normally start climbing by just walking into a climbable wall in this game? Oh no. That button prompts. They're trying to teach me to jump. 
They want me to initiate this otherwise extremely legal climb with a criminal jump. I can't believe they actually turned off climbing activation from walking to force a jump here. Is this truly our fate? The challenge invalidated and spat upon by the game within minutes of starting? No. We may not be able to walk into a climb here, but we can run. Take that, Nintendo. Looks like you forgot to disable climb activation by running. That, my friends, is the Shrine of Resurrection Overcome, and this vista marks the start of our next obstacle, the Great Plateau. And let me tell you, the Great Plateau starts off fairly devoid of any challenge. We speak with the old man, grab some weapons, activate the tower, descend the tower, and make our way to and through the Magnesis Shrine without even the slightest temptation to jump. That puts us at three more shrines needed in order to escape the plateau. And the one my sights are on next is the bomb one. I decided to approach this one from behind, as without the ability to jump while climbing, scaling the walls in front of the shrine in full view of a guardian seemed... inadvisable. The shrine itself is no issue. On to the next one. Climbing to the stasis shrine is perfectly possible without jumping, albeit a bit slower, and once again the shrine itself poses little threat to us. Before venturing to the Cryonis Shrine, I figured obtaining the Warm Doublet would be beneficial. This was quite doable, though catching a fish certainly isn't quite as straightforward when we can't dash in the water. Still possible, though. With a doublet equipped, the route to the Cryonis Shrine, as well as the shrine itself, doesn't challenge us too much. Likewise, navigating back to the Temple of Time proves to be a relatively simple task. There we finally receive the Paraglider, an object which we must resist the urge to use at all costs going forward. That commitment is then presumably tested almost immediately. After all, we need to get off the Great Plateau, and achieving that goal is the exact pretense the game used to justify forcing us to get the Paraglider. So how do we get down without gliding, then? Well, we just climb down. I know, I wish it was a more interesting answer too, but honestly... Getting off the Great Plateau is barely an inconvenience. With the Great Plateau behind us, our next stop is Kakariko Village, but not before fighting a Stone Talus. For honestly no particularly justifiable reason. We'll also be activating the Dueling Peaks Tower and conquering the Reed Dahi and Ra Damar Shrines for much more justifiable reasons. We get into a good bit of combat along the road to Kakariko, and this seems as good a time as any to highlight how fundamentally this challenge has altered the way in which I handle combat in this game. When I play Breath of the Wild normally, my approach to combat primarily entails loads and loads of perfect dodges and flurry rushes. Without being able to press the X button, that style of combat is completely invalidated. As such, at least so far, I've been gravitating towards more resourceful means of dispatching foes, using a lot of remote bombs and large metallic objects whenever I get the chance. I've also been using the terrain to my advantage more. As it turns out, if you knock an enemy off a cliff, they aren't really your problem anymore. When it comes to the more standard weapons, not being able to dodge has greatly impacted the utility of certain classes of weapons. Hardest hit are the two-handed slashing weapons. Without dodging, these weapons offer you little to no defensive options when equipped. Maybe you can knock down the foe before they get a chance to hit you, although even that isn't terribly likely given how slow these weapons generally are. And if you can't get that to work, you're left with only your normal movement controls to dodge attacks with, which are far from useless, but certainly nothing special. Not quite as bad as the two-handed slashing weapons are the pole arms. They suffer from a lot of the same disadvantages in terms of defense as we just detailed. The difference here is that, in my opinion, the polearm's offensive capabilities are good enough to make some of that defense less necessary. The big differences here are speed and reach, both of which the polearms excel at. Better speed means that we can get more attacks in before our enemies have a chance to retaliate, and a better reach allows us to sometimes be able to attack from outside their range to begin with and with any luck or knockback, keep them out of range. Ultimately though, the gold standard in melee weapons for this challenge are one-handed weapons. This is for the obvious reason that one-handed weapons allow for the use of a shield in conjunction with them. 
This greatly improves our position in terms of defense by both giving us an ability to passively block a wide array of attacks, as well as the ability to try our hands at blocking actively and attempting to get perfect parries. I still don't like the perfect parry as much as the perfect dodge. In my opinion, it's a higher risk for generally less reward. But when it's all you got, it's all you got, and it's certainly better than nothing. And that's the melee weapons ranked. I might as well mention now that when practical, bows are actually my weapon of choice for this challenge. As it turns out, limited defensive capabilities don't matter all that much when the enemy is dead before they even know where you are. Now what were we doing before I got on this whole weapons tangent? Hmm. Right, Kakariko Village. We don't face any insurmountable hurdles on our way there, and as such are able to talk to Impa. While I was in town, I tried to tell on the Egg Shrine, Turns out, though, that it's the combat tutorial, which means they force you to dodge to complete it. Good thing it's optional. An optional thing I did manage was rounding up the cookers. Now, to Hatena Village. There we catch some crickets, utilize my usual method of clearing the Myam Agana Shrine, and grab myself a camera room. Then it's a quick teleport back to Kakariko to start the Memories Quest. And with that administrative work taken care of, it's finally time to get to the Midifar Quest. Let's free some divine beasts, and chart a course for Death Mountain. On our way there, we take care of the following tasks. The Dakatus Shrine, the Sherata Shrine, the Miro Shaz Shrine. I, I actually almost got myself stuck in this one, since if you drop off the slightly raised platform, you can't just walk back up. Normally you'd have to jump, but I used a uh, different method. And of course, a bit of combat was had. Nevertheless, here we are at the foot of Death Mountain. Just gotta make myself some chili elixirs and we're set to go. Going to sneak around the Guardian and kill everything else along the path. And then start burning? But I have the elixir. Oh, right. It's not heat resistance you need here, it's fire resistance. How could I have gotten that mixed up? Honestly, how? Oh. Uh. Well, let's try again. Alright, I actually have the correct type of elixir this time. Let's do this. And this time, let's kill that guardian. A few perfect parries is all it takes, and there you go. A safer path for generations to come. We do eventually encounter another, although given how all my shields at this point are wood, and would start combusting if I pulled them out on this part of the mountain, we'll go for the stun and run approach this time. And what do you know, we've run straight into a tower. The Elden Tower, to be precise. Let's climb it while we're here. From this point on, the path to Goron City is pretty smooth sailing. First thing we do at Goron City is sell off some minerals to buy the Flamebreaker armor, and then, of course, take on the quest to bring down Varudania. We've got to find some Yunobu character. I'm sure it can't be that hard. Just like the Shame Muza Shrine. Alright, up to the mines we go. Defeat some Muzafos, and then find this... Lava straight between us and where we need to go. This would normally be overcome by gliding, but obviously we can't do that. And unsurprisingly, running off the cliff isn't particularly effective, to put it lightly. Another idea would be using a bomb to launch us across, and while they definitely don't have the power to get us the whole way across, we might be able to land on one of those islands in the center. Okay, this still might be technically possible, but there's got to be a better way to go about this. What if we used stasis to launch ourselves across in a minecart? I don't know. Let's try it. Wow, that actually worked! Now to save Yonobo! Wait, another gap? Oh, this is a whole archipelago, isn't it? And I seem to have lost my minecart as well. Just how many successful launches in a row would we need to pull this off, exactly? Uh, too many, by my estimate. Uh, the way I see it, we need to forget this whole launching nonsense, and instead, 
see if perhaps we can fly. Flying machines are a fairly well-known exploit in Breath of the Wild. The theory is relatively simple. The magnesis rune does not let you pick up objects that you are standing on, presumably because the designers didn't want you to uh, be able to fly. The workaround is that the game doesn't notice if you're standing on an object on top of the metallic one you're lifting. The usual way to achieve this is by stacking a couple of minecarts on top of each other. I've never personally used one before, so hopefully they're not that hard to build and get a handle on. Wish me luck. Well, that didn't go very well. It seems that I'm not very good at the whole flying machine thing. Maybe I should actually learn how it's supposed to be done? To that end, I have found this video uploaded by one cleric that is supposed to teach you how to build and fly one of these things properly. Any skills I present regarding flying machines going forward are from that video. If you want to know the nitty gritty on how to actually build or fly one of these things, I'd recommend you start there. For now, though, let's see if I've made any progress. And what do you know? It's actually working. With this machine operational, it is definitely possible to get to the island with the cannon, and then to the cave said cannon blew an entrance to. And therein we find our quarry, Yanopo. With our partner finally freed, it's time to take the fight to Redania. The road there is treacherous and filled with numerous enemies. Luckily, I discovered the virtue of another class of weapon. Boomerangs. They have all the advantages of a one-handed weapon, but they're also really good throwables, thus giving us range like a bow. In short, these things are great and make short work of the moblins we encounter en route. The process of actually boarding Rudania goes fairly well. Sure, some of these sentries could be dispatched a bit quicker if one were to use a paraglider, but with so many climbable walls around, none are insurmountable obstacles. After a few cannon shots, Link does use the paraglider in this cutscene, but cutscenes don't count. So here we are, aboard our first divine beast of the challenge. Theoretically, these beasts could be trouble for us on account of the lack of climbable surfaces. If the developers wanted to force jumping or paraglider use, these weapons of mass destruction would be the place to do it. Do they force it here, though? No. There were a couple tricky terminals, like this one here that we had to drop quite precisely onto, and this one on the back that I ended up blowing the malice off of with a remote bomb because the eye was out of my view. Then the Fireblight's Ganon fight is mostly done at significant distance with slow-moving projectiles. Uh, and honestly, this is probably the type of fight that these challenges rules hamper us in the least, so no problems here. And there you go, Divine Beast number one is cleared. I feel, though, that the worst of this challenge may still be ahead of us. I've always considered Valridania to be the easiest of the Divine Beasts, and I see no reason that would be different in this challenge. The next one we're headed to is Valruta in Zora's Domain, although I'm planning on getting some shrines cleared along the eastern coast on my way there. In any case, it's time to depart from Death Mountain. Our route of departure takes us to the Kwa Ram Shrine. Then we recall a memory. After a bit of a walk from there, I find myself at the Moakit Shrine, followed by the Da Hesho Shrine. The Kam Mai Shrine was a bit less straightforward. What you do here is stand on one side of the scale, then drop a big metal box on the other side. This action sends you flying upwards. It's at this point that I presume a normal person would pull out their paraglider and gracefully float to the upper platform. In our case, though, we don't have such a graceful way of manipulating our midair momentum. One could even argue we don't have any way to alter our midair momentum. If you did make that argument, though, you'd be wrong. What we can do is place a remote bomb on the platform with us, then when we go up, so does the bomb. At that point, it's just a matter of activating the bomb while in midair, which is something that you can do. And there we go. 
Little to no grace, but guess who's on the upper platform. After besting that shrine, I quickly found that the way I was going turned out to be a dead end. So I marched right back through East Akala, and by marched I mean road. That's right, I stole a horse from some bokoblins, which is as easy as knocking them off and pressing the A button. Everybody, meet Boko. While I was in the area, I also decided to activate the East Akala Tower, which this long metal door thing proved extremely useful for. After that, I took on the Z Kasho Shrine, which was an utter nightmare, although I think that's just the way it always is. Seeing how it was this motion control thing that was giving me trouble, I don't think the challenge was to blame. After a bit of a ride, we activate the Laneru Tower, which means we're now practically at Zora's Domain. That means it's time to follow Prince Sidon and brave the combat-filled road there. Combat has gotten a bit easier since freeing Rudania, that's because we've got Daruk's protection now, which helps a bit with the defensive issues plaguing two-handed weapons. We of course can't constantly use it as a crutch, since we only get three uses of it before it has to recharge, but it helps. What also helps is intelligent use of shields and taking on the arguably most difficult part of this route, the part with all the Lazalfas shooting shock arrows at you, by camping and sniping. With all that going for us, it's no surprise that we make it to Zora's Domain in one piece. Once there, we of course take out the local shrine, the Nez Yama Shrine. With that out of the way, we turn our sights on Divine Beast Baruta. But first, we've got to deal with some racism. Alright, that was surprisingly easy. What now? I need to get some shock arrows, apparently. Well, psych! I already have at least 20 shock arrows. Come on, Sidon. Varuta awaits. The fight for entry begins as it normally would. We've got to cry on us away the ice blocks, so Sidon has the opportunity to bring us in close. From there, we swim up a waterfall, and... Oh. That's not going to work. Just to be clear, I didn't activate the paraglider separately here. As it turns out, swimming up waterfalls automatically pulls it out. That is a real shame, because swimming up the waterfalls on Varuta gives us such a nice angle on our targets. It's not the only one we can get, though. If we form a Cryonis Pillar in the water, then hop off Sidon and climb up it, which is really annoying without the ability to jump since the rain makes it quite slippery. Uh, luckily, our climbing bandana gives us enough of a speed boost to at least occasionally make it up before slipping. Anyway, from there, we can take shots at Varuta. Much more difficult arced shots, but shots nonetheless. Using this method, with our last shock arrow, we can bring Varuta's entrance down to sea level. And now, the real fun begins. Alright, seven points of interest to activate here. One map terminal, five regular terminals, and the central control unit. Let's go. The map terminal is the first one down, and is done essentially standardly. Next up is the one with the gears, which, again, requires no deviation from the normal method of activating it. The one in the small water wheel is swum to no problem. The path to the center of the large wheel is quite navigable for us, and from there, a bit of rotation and stasis gets us to our goal. The next two terminals would normally be reached with loads of gliding. Obviously, that's not in the cards for us. So, what do we do? Let's start by answering that question for the one in the head with all the fire. First, we run a good distance out onto the trunk. Then while standing there, we raise the trunk a bit. Now we move around to stand more so on the side of the trunk, and then raise it some more. And by some more, I mean all the way. This puts us right above the head. From there, all we've got to do is drop down and put out the fire. That just leaves one more terminal. This one, though, is on the very tip of the trunk. I'm honestly not sure how we're going to get there. This might seem weird, but let's try to get there this way. First thing we'll do is run out as far along the trunk as we possibly can. Then, we'll raise it and do the whole getting more on the side of the trunk thing we did last turn. From here, if we run, we can actually get onto the back of the trunk, which is probably useful. Maybe? From this position, I think what would make the most sense is raising the trunk up as far as possible, which reveals to us that just being on the back of the trunk isn't enough, since there's this big wall here. We can't go over or around it, but what if we went under it? You end up in this weird place, that's what happens. Right here, we're actually directly under the terminal. Not that it matters. 
unless we can somehow turn this position we've got into, into an advantageous position. Well, to that end, maybe a bit of sprinting to get here will help. Okay, we're back outside and super close to the terminal, but it's still just barely out of reach. Or is it? This wall we're right next to looks pretty steep. My first inclination was to try and get around it somehow. But, as it turns out, with enough determination, you can actually run straight up it, and by such means gain access to the last terminal. That means it's time to go to the main control unit and fight Water Blight Gap. This fight went pretty well. A combination of archery and cryonis kept me pretty safe throughout the fight, leading of course to our second conquest of a divine beast. We're halfway there now, and our next destination will be Gerudo Town and Vanaboris. I'll plan a route following the southern coast to get us there. That route first takes us to the Rucko Mog Shrine, then the So Coffee Shrine. I then swing by Kakariko Village to pick up the Champion's Tunic, as well as some stealth tights and a Hylian Hood. My next mini-adventure is the Kam Urag Shrine. I stop by Hatena Village to upgrade some of my runes, and then sail to Eventide Island, home of the Korgu Chide Shrine. From there, I sail to the Chasis Keda Shrine. I then get back to the mainland and venture through the Yarin Shrine. Next, I venture through the Faron Jungle and even climb the Faron Tower. Then, with the region's map in hand, I go back along the coast to the Kaya Shrine. Through to the other side of the jungle lies my next stop, the Pumag Nate Shrine. Next up is activating the Lake Tower. Then after that, we clear the Kao Makag Shrine. Then after that, we stumble upon the Bosch Kala Shrine, which, uh, yeah, I don't think I'm even going to try this one. What I will try, and in fact succeed at, is recalling a memory. Then we tackle the Wagokata Shrine, followed by the Hilo Rao Shrine, then another memory. And after more traveling, we're finally starting to near the Gerudo Desert, but not before we take care of the Gino Shrine, and scaling the Wasteland Tower. We also stop by the Kano Shrine while we're on our way. And finally, after all that, we arrive at Kara Kara Bazaar, and can properly start our quest to take down Naboris. The steps for gaining entry to Gerudo Town proper are the same as ever. Recall memory, beat Dako Chase Shrine, and cross dress. Then the Yiga Clan hideout is theoretically a bit harder than normal, since we can't do the little sneaking jump thing, but climbing around and traveling atop the whole thing ends up working out quite well. Master Koga is then as easy as ever, and sand sealing our way to Van Naboris poses no particular issue. Now how about Van Naboris itself? The map terminal is beyond simple. Since this platform is well within falling range from the platform we're currently on, the same applies to terminal number one. Once you get the electricity flowing, the terminal on the head is another one that we have little trouble with. After some rotation, all it takes is a remote bomb to bring us to terminal number three. I couldn't be bothered to get the second electric ball, so I ended up using a bunch of my weapons and shields to activate the fourth terminal. After that, the final terminal was a mere elevator ride away. Getting to the main control unit was also no problem, so now we get to face Thunder Blight Gap. This one is, in my opinion, the hardest of the Blights in a normal playthrough and it would seem that'll hold true in this challenge as well. My usual approach to this boss entails a bunch of dodges and flurry rushes. That obviously can't be the case today. I tried shooting at it with my bow from afar, but this Ganon's shield quickly shoots down that approach's viability. Instead, we'll make use of our own shield to block the flurry of blows that the Blight sends our way, then respond with our own counterattack the first strikes of which are blocked. However, we are able to, with some determination and endurance, break through the Blight's guard and actually land some hits. This approach works pretty well for us. Until the halfway points. This is where Thunder Blight Ganon really emphasizes the thunder part of its name, by infusing its sword with electricity. An electric weapon essentially nullifies the effect of our shield, it does so by damaging us and making us drop our weapons if it makes contact with us at all, whether or not we block it. Considering the extent to which we've been relying on blocks in this fight, 
that's a pretty unfortunate turn of events for us. It doesn't lack a solution, though, as we can nullify the effects of the electricity as easily as it nullified our shield by simply drinking a shock-resistance elixir, which essentially returns this fight to the first half status quo, a status quo that works in our favor, leading to Thunder Blight Ganon's demise and us having just one divine beast left to conquer. The Airborne Vomido. Before we go there, though, there's some other business I want to take care of, like this memory, the Jitan Sami Shrine, which is considerably more difficult to do without gliding since it has the whole uh, chasing down a dragon part of it, finally climbing the Hateno Tower, and the Woodland Tower, retrieving the Master Sword, and uh, that's actually one of our main objectives completed! Hooray! Uh, as a result, we officially don't have to do shrines anymore, since the main reason we were doing them in the first place was to get enough hearts to pull the Master Sword. One thing we do still need to do is get more memories, like this one. We also have more towers to climb, like the Ridgeland Tower, which featured one of the most annoying fights ever at its base. Flying electric enemies over a lake. That's a real good time, let me tell you. Much less annoying was the Hebra Tower, which is the last place we stop at before finally arriving at Rito Village. I have no idea how we can even hope to take down Vomido without the paraglider, but uh, we must press on regardless. Even if we fail here, I want to fail having given the challenge everything I've got, not by resigning at the first sign of turmoil. Before we take on Mido, I'd like to activate the region's tower, the Tabantha Tower, and while we're in the area, recalling this memory would be nice too. Alright, that was easy. Now we head to the Flight Range to get some much needed help in reaching the Divine Beast. There we find Teba, a Rito warrior who should hopefully serve as our ride to Vamado, but only if we can prove ourselves in the Flight Range. This should be interesting. What the game is trying to do here is verify that we know how to glide around and execute slow motion aerial archery with some degree of competence. Uh, presumably because it'll be important later or something. But we'll worry about that later. Right now, all we've got to do is conquer the Flight Range. This task actually proves to be a surprisingly simple matter, as you can actually shoot all the targets required to prove yourself just by standing on the starting platform. So, with our skills at aerial archery somehow proven by that display, it's time for us to board the Divine Beast. Teba flies up to it. It's got four weak points that we have to hit with bomb arrows. And let me remind you that we're going to have to hit all four of those while airborne without using the paraglider. Good thing we've got Teba here to give us a lift. Alright, Teba? Uh, Teba? This is not what I had in mind for a plan! Okay, so uh, here's the situation. As soon as the encounter with Vomido begins in earnest, Link of his own volition decides to pull out the paraglider. This is something the game does automatically for us, and as such, there doesn't seem to be a way to avoid it. Now, I could make some semantic argument along the lines of, well, technically we didn't use the paraglider, the game activated the paraglider in something akin to a cutscene. And therefore, we still haven't technically used the paraglider ourselves. Challenge saved. I could try to make that argument, but let's be honest. This isn't a cutscene. In fact, the moment the paraglider begins its release is a transition from the cutscene-like element here, the dialogue, to actual gameplay. And just based on appearances, does this look like not using a paraglider to you? Yeah, I, I don't think so. As sad as it may be. Very few can achieve a mastery of the sky. The game in one of the most forceful methods it has at its disposal has declared. Maybe we should just settle this one-on-one. -on -one. How about up there? If we want to beat every divine beast... Oh, you must pardon me. We must glide. I forgot you have no way of making it up to that divine beast on your own. And honestly, I can't say I didn't see this coming. 
if anything was going to stop us, it was going to be the Guardian of the Skies. The Divine Beast you can't even get near without gliding. Regardless of our flying machines, our trunk parkour, our elixirs, it was always going to end here. Destined to be defeated by Vomito. Yet despite these truths, it seems that I've been tapped to merely assist you. I mean, it's just asinine. Unless you think you can prove me wrong? No, Rivali. I don't. That being said, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't at least try. This will likely be a fruitless attempt at subverting the inevitable, but the reason we can't discount this gliding altogether is because it occurs during gameplay instead of a cutscene. And if it's occurring during gameplay, that by definition means we can at least try some things. One thing set in stone about this section is that the paraglider is at the very least called upon for service. That's not a button I choose to press, it just happens when the dialogue is over. We likely can't subvert that, at least not without some sort of crazy glitch that I don't think actually exists, and if it does, I wasn't able to find during all my searching. That leaves our only option being mitigating the damage caused by the game telling Link to get out the paraglider. The most obvious thing to try would be pressing the button to put it away as quickly as possible which at the very least minimizes paraglider time, which I suppose is going to be useful for shifting this into a minimum paraglider run, but still leaves us with the paraglider existing for a few frames. That being said, this was only attempt number one, so maybe we can do better. We can indeed do better. The paraglider on this attempt existed for slightly less frames. This is encouraging. Who knows, maybe if we're fast enough we can stop the paraglider from existing at all. So this is my life now, starting the Vomido fight, putting away the paraglider as quickly as I can, then pausing the game to review the footage frame by frame and seeing if I had made any progress. Eventually my efforts yielded this result. Here the paraglider was only visible for three frames. That's one tenth of a second. As a point of reference, the average human reaction time for visual stimulus is about a quarter of a second. That means that quite literally, by the time a theoretical person in the Zelda world would be able to react to seeing the paraglider, it would already be gone. If it was ever truly there at all. One thing I don't think is controversial about the paraglider is that it's a solid opaque object. Yet, you'll notice in these three frames, the paraglider is translucent. And let me tell you, that is a major noticeable shift that happens during this animation. If the paraglider were allowed to exist for a fourth and then fifth frame, it would become fully opaque, a fully present object in the world. Yet, if the paraglider is kept to these three frames, or even a fourth one technically, it never becomes opaque, never becomes fully present. Some of you may disagree with this interpretation, but I'm counting this as a win. I think what we're seeing here is Link tries to start using the paraglider, but doesn't actually finish the job as it were. Hey guys, it's uh, Simicraft from the edit here. Uh, I just wanted to cut in because I noticed something while editing this video that I hadn't noticed before now. So I wanted to present one more piece of evidence that uh, would indicate that we did actually successfully subvert the paraglider section here with this attempt where the paraglider is visible for three frames and at that translucent for all of those frames. The piece of evidence in question is this button prompt. That is a button prompt that only appears when you are in the air and not already paragliding. You'll notice that that button prompt is on screen for the entire duration that we can actually see the paraglider. What I think this means is even on every frame here where we can visually see the paraglider, the game doesn't consider us to have it equipped, because this button prompt only appears when we are falling in the air and not already paragliding. And if we compare it to some of the attempts where we had more frames on display, you'll see that the button prompt doesn't show up until the very end of those attempts. Therefore, I'm actually fairly confident in saying, technically speaking, I don't think we actually had a single legitimate paraglider frame here. So, uh, yeah, that's just something I noticed while I was editing. I think it strengthens my case considerably here, and uh, I hope you all agree. If not, uh, tell me why I'm wrong in the comments. Anyways, uh, back to the video. 
So we've dodged a forced paraglider section, which honestly I didn't think we could go into this. So that's snitch. See, the thing is though, we still need to actually beat the Divine Beast, which, when you consider the typical way of doing that entails gliding around, taking shots at the weak points, all the while navigating around mid-air, that may be easier said than done. I think one thing we can do to make our lives easier here is go to Hateno Village and use the Devil Statue there to exchange all our extra hearts for stamina wheels. This will allow us to hang in slow-mo archery for as long as possible, which should be helpful. Now back to Vomito. One thing I will note here is that we do have a pretty decent safety net. This is because if we let ourselves fall too low, we don't die or anything. Teba just saves us and brings us back to the pre-fight dialogue. But, and this is important, all of the damage we've done to the Divine Beast is still present. That means we don't need to get some series of 8 miracle shots off in one fall. Yes, every fall does mean that we need to test our reflexes, at getting the paraglider put away again, but if we can manage it once, we can repeat it. Now the only question remaining is whether or not we can make these shots from here. And yes, it does have to be from here, since without the paraglider we have basically zero aerial mobility. Except for downwards. We've got that one pretty damn packed. The close one is extremely easy. The two middle distanced ones take a bit of doing to get the right angle, but we can see where the arrows are landing and adjust our shots accordingly. After a while, I got a pretty good hand on what part of the distant mountains I had to aim at to land my shots. And then there's the far one. It's a blind shot that must be arced perfectly to land, and once we fire the shot, we have no idea how close it was. For a long time, I doubted this shot was even possible. Until... I witnessed a health bar appear at the far side of the beast. I had made contact. The last weak point bled, and I knew then and there, if it was possible to hit it once, it was possible to hit it twice, and hit it twice I did, overcoming the impossible and thus gaining access to Vomido without the use of a parrot. Welcome. To Divine Beast Vomido. Practically speaking, the puzzles here should be the last major obstacle between us and succeeding at this challenge as a whole. Let us hope they pale in comparison to the difficulty of gaining entry in the first place. First thing to do is get the map, which is done essentially normally. This was our first proper terminal, again activated in the usual manner. This one in the same wing definitely can't be overcome in the usual manner, because the usual manner is gliding. But you know what? This magnetic ball is about the same height as the platform the terminal is on. I wonder... Wow, that actually worked! Points for thinking outside the box. The next two terminals are a bit more boring, once again being beaten in pretty much the exact way you would do so sans challenge. That leaves just one terminal for us to activate. And honestly, I'm not sure how we're going to pull this one off. But you know what? We did the impossible to get here in the first place, so let's try it. I've got a few ideas. Not sure if any of them are any good, though. There's no way this will work, but just to cover our bases, running off the cliff in attempt to cross the pit. Remote Bomb Explosion Running out the window. Running out the window onto a stasis magnetic ball. Same stasis magnetic ball play, but this time from the entrance.
bomb from a different ledge. Amiibo? Ah, come on. Getting an upgraded set of stealth clothes to give me a night speed bonus to maybe let me cross the gap easier? Riding a stasis launched magnetic ball across the gap. Two remote bombs. An attempt at wind bombs without jumping? Which, come to think of it, is a pretty foundational part of that speedrunning tactic. Remote bomb while tilting the bird. Riding stasis magnetic ball while tilting the bird? Stasis magnetic ball out the window while tilting the bird. Running out the window with a remote ball. Running on this part of the way. Wait, how is this supposed to help exactly? Launching a stasis magnetic ball into myself with a bomb. Running out the window with a bomb while tilting the bird? I don't know, trying to glitch through the wall, I guess? Running out the window onto a stasis magnetic ball, then running off that with a bomb while tilting the bird. Attempting to run on the underside of the wing? Sure, well, why not? Who cares about gravity anyways? Who cares, honestly? What? You're kidding me. That's what worked? Well, after just over seven hours of work on that one terminal, I I'm just glad it's over, I'll take what I can get. Who cares that it was the simplest, stupidest idea that got the job done? Well, with that out of the way, all we have left to do here is get to the central control unit and beat the boss. A central control unit that you'd normally access by gliding on an updraft. Cue another two hours of me trying to figure out how to get on top of the wings of this thing. You'll never guess what the solution here ended up being. That's right, you can just run up this thing if you find the exact right spot. Who would have thought? And after all that, the boss fight really can't come back. Well, I'll be plucked. You defeated him, eh? Who would have thought?
far. Well done. I suppose I should thank you now that my spirit is free. We've officially done it. We've beaten Vamadao. <laughs> Don't preen yourself just for doing your job. We've beaten Vamado without jumping or gliding. <sighs> After all these years, I simply must admit the truth. Even without the power of flight, Link made his way to this divine beast and accomplished something that even I could not. And after conquering this, I can't imagine anything could stop us now. Your job is far from finished, you know. The princess has been waiting an awful long time. And we'll get to her, don't you worry. But first, we've got a few loose ends to tie up. One of those loose ends would be the remaining memories, which I'm happy to report don't cause us any particular difficulty. That just leaves us with two towers standing between us and Gamma. One of them is the central tower. This one is guarded by guardians. Luckily, the Master Sword can make especially quick work of these mobility-lacking variants. Then once they're dead, climbing up is just another one of our routine climbs. That leaves Gerudo Tower as our last objective to complete before defeating Gamma. I can't imagine it would be too hard, since all the towers are all about climbing, which is an activity well within the realms of legality. Huh. I can't say I anticipated the tower shooting out of a bottomless pit, though. It likely goes without saying, but normally the paraglider would come to your rescue here. That's obviously not happening today. There may be a way to gain a similar effect, though, through legal means. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the extraordinary natural specimen that is the Cuckoo. These magnificent creatures are clearly not paragliders and therefore perfectly legal for us to utilize by holding them and running off cliffs. This panicked flapping which the Cuckoo instinctively engages under such circumstances, while not enough to overcome Link's weight and yield the Cuckoo flight per se, it does cause the Cuckoos, and by extension our, descent to slow significantly. Perhaps significantly enough to get to that tower. The only issue with this plan is that as far as I'm aware, Cuckoos are not native to the Gerudo Highlands. Which means, if we want to try this method of accessing the tower, we're going to have to escort one from elsewhere. I'm thinking Kakarika Village should be as good a place as any to source our cookers from. So, without further ado, let the great Cuckoo Road Trip Adventure begin! Okay, uh, I was honestly not expecting to run into a guardian on this route, and it would seem that I have lost my cuckoo in the scuff. Alright, uh, let's try that again, and this time I'll activate my cuckoo locator. Yes, that is a real thing that exists in this game. Let the great cuckoo road trip adventure begin anew! So I lost the Cuckoo in a fight again. Uh, this time it was against some members of the Yiga clan. I think perhaps a more stealthy approach would be advisable for attempt number three. Of the great Cuckoo Road Trip Adventure! I suppose we'll likely want to gain some height as we press into the highlands, if for no other reason than the fact that it's difficult to gain height on demand while escorting with the Cuckoo, since we can't climb while holding it. Oh. 
I was so worried that all my hard work of getting the cookout to this point would be completely for naught there. Ah, oh, thank you for sparing my life, Cuckoo. And, uh, speaking of where we are right now, we're actually just one cliff away from the tower. And, of course, this last cliff just so happens to be one of the cliffs that, uh, we can't seem to cheese and, uh, just get up with the Cuckoo. Luckily, I've yet to use my absolute cheesiest resource, a Guardian Amoeba. Just a bit of Magnesis, and here we are. Please don't mess this up. Yes! This, my friends, is the last tower to conquer. That means the time has come to invade Hyrule Castle and beat Gen. As it turns out, all our practice defending with shields has prepared us well for this castle. In particular, we are well equipped to fight the Guardian turrets with it. And on the topic of shields, why not grab the best shield in the game while we're here? Ultimately, while we aren't able to skip most of the castle like I did on my first playthrough, we can certainly still get through the castle, and with minimal jump-related setbacks. Now it's time to fight the big man himself. And honestly, I think he went down easier than on my original playthrough. As luck would have it, perfect blocks and archery are the exact skills you want to have refined for this fight, as opposed to dodging and flurry rush. And boy, have we refined those skills on this run. Calamity Ganon goes down no problem, which leaves Dark Beast Ganon as the only thing left that can even hope to stop us. And given this boss's reputation as one of the easiest bosses to ever grace a Zelda game, I don't think he's going to be the one to stop us. Like I predicted, we make quick work of him, and in no time we're aiming our final shot right at that massive eye of his. We release... And he blinks. Okay. Uh, bad timing, I guess. We loose another arrow. And another blink. Uh, okay, um, third time's the charm. We fire upon this monstrosity for a third time. And once again, with impeccable timing, he blinks. I'll tell you, this man's blinking game is on point today. And he simply will not let up. Arrow after arrow flies towards his face, only to be thwarted by his oscillating eyelid. All the while, Zelda implores me to use these updrafts to my advantage, that I may gain a higher vantage point against my foe. Little does she know that such a course of action would betray my deepest held convictions and principles. But if we don't glide up, how will we land this last vital shot? It seems that elevation is key to ending this fight, and at present, I have none. Nor a method by which to gain it. But what's that? I know exactly what that is. It's the Hyrule Tower. If we can but make it to and climb the tower, we may yet find ourselves in a winnable position. Come along, Ganon! We're taking this battle to new heights! What? Barrier? No. Our last hope, locked behind an arbitrary wall. How will we gain our height advantage now? Is the banner of Hyrule truly doomed to fly over the land of Ganon in perpetuity? Wait. Banner. That's it! Plague Pulse, I'm so sorry. All this time, I exalted the great structures of Hyrule in this challenge. The towers, the divine beasts, the shrines, while paying little mind to the lowly flagpole. Little did I know that when it really counted, not one tower, not one shrine, not one beast would come to my aid. But you, flagpoles, in spite of my lack of respect for you all these hours, now, in my moment of true need, you are the structures here for me. The Divine Beast may have been what made this challenge interesting, but you, Flagpole, you are what makes it possible.
So there you go. It is possible to beat The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild without jumping or gliding. Honestly, this challenge was great, an absolute joy and pleasure to take part in. It took a long while, but in my opinion, every second was worth it. This challenge got real tough at certain parts, but all that frustration experienced was hugely offset by the absolute flood of dopamine when those tough, seemingly impossible obstacles were finally overcome. And just to be clear, some of these parts did seem completely impossible going in. When I started this challenge, I was fully prepared to write off Vomido as completely off the table. And then it wasn't. And the joy I experienced at that revelation marks one of the high points of any of these challenges for me thus far. Right up there with the likes of Honey Hive Galaxy, among other moments. Anyway, that's enough gushing about the challenge. This already may be my longest challenge video, so I should wrap this up pretty quick. In short, it's a very rewarding challenge, and if you're looking for something Zelda-related to do to tide you over for Breath of the Wild 2, I would certainly recommend it. And now for, I guess, the standard end of video stuff. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, comment, heck, maybe even share it with some of your friends that you think might be into it. Because, here's the secret, guys. These longer, more ambitious videos and challenges, like this one and the 3D World Low Score video, take a lot more time and effort to make than the 10 to 15 minutes stuff. I can only justify making something like this if I see there's actually significant interest in it. So, especially if you like and prefer these bigger, more ambitious videos, please show your support. It means a whole lot to me. And speaking of big, ambitious videos, if you have any suggestions along those lines, I would love to hear them in the comments. Oh, and uh, don't forget, I've got a Let's Play channel now. If you're into that sort of thing, check it out. We're playing the original Fire Emblem and Super Mario Sunshine over there right now. But anyways, guys, until next time, I've been Simicraft, and I will catch you in the next video. I think I've got some more golden ideas to try. Goodbye.